Hello, my name is Chris Morrison, and thank you for joining me in this presentation on the cosmological argument that I've titled Grounding the Kalam. Now, I call it that uh, because, as most of us know, the Kalam cosmological argument is particularly popular. It comes under a lot of objections. I think most of the objections can be overcome, but there is one particular objection I want to talk about that I, I, I think the traditional rendering of the argument has difficulty with. Um, and I think that if we ground it properly, we can actually restate the argument more powerfully so that we can overcome that objection and, again, have a really good argument for the case of God. So with that being said, uh, we're just going to walk through the argument as traditionally given, look at a few objections, then look at a way to restate it so that it will be valid and, I think, particularly persuasive. All right, getting started, it helps first to define the cosmological argument. And I think there's three things that are useful to know with any kind of cosmological argument. First of all, a cosmological argument is any one that starts with the cosmos, that is, the world. And we should note here that the cosmos doesn't necessarily have to include the entire universe. There are some versions that deal with some aspect of the universe, some that deal with the universe as a whole. Uh, the point is that it starts with what's out there, outside of our senses. It's an observational type argument. That leads to the next part, which is that it's an a posteriori argument. That's uh, a big word that basically means it's after the investigation. That would, that would be compared to an a priori argument, uh, which would be before investigation, which is just in reason. And you can see there in a posteriori the word post, which means after, and an a priori the word prior, meaning before. So because we said the cosmological arguments are arguments that deal with the cosmos, it's these are we go out into the universe, we examine the universe, therefore it's after examination. These are a posteriori arguments. And the third and final thing is they result in a cause of some sort for this cosmos, whatever aspect of the cosmos that we're studying. So anytime you come across an argument that has those three things, that it examines some aspect of the universe or the, or the entirety of it, that because it's an examination, it is an a posteriori argument, it's an examination of the evidence, it's not strictly a matter of reason, let's say Anselm's ontological argument is, and then that also that concludes in a cause for this cosmos, then you know you're dealing with some particular form of a cosmological argument. Now I say a form of a cosmological argument because you'll find there are many. There are, in short, there are really three families of a cosmological arguments. Uh, the first is really represented best by Thomas Aquinas. Those are those that have ordered causes. And now just as a personal aside, I happen to think that these are really the most persuasive, but I think they probably require more philosophical training than perhaps most have, uh, maybe a little more difficult to explain and more difficult to use. Um, so they may not be uh, effective in, in, in normal situation, but basically what they come as an ordered cause uh, it, in order to cause here, the best way to explain that is it's it's simultaneous causes. Imagine that you are you are pushing a a stick, and that stick is pushing a rock. That's Thomas Aquinas' example. Those are ordered. The moment you cease to push the stick, the stick stops, and therefore the the um, the rock stops moving. Or perhaps a more modern example would be a, a boxcar train. The engine is pulling, and it may be pulling 10 or 20 or 100 cars behind it. Uh, well, if you ask what's pulling one of the cars, it's the car right in front of it, and the car right in front of it, and ultimately on up into the engine itself is really doing the pulling. So this, these would be ordered causes. Uh, and again, if you want to see an example of those, look at Thomas Aquinas' five ways, and really the first three in particular. The second family is what's more common to us, what's more easily understood would be from temporal causes, and these are represented best by William Lane Craig. He's done a lot of work, especially in the Kalam, which is what we're going to be obviously looking at here. A temporal cause is much more obvious. It's A happens, then B happens. Uh, my parents produced me, I produced my daughter, and et, et cetera. Um, you know, uh, a person throws a ball, uh, the batter swings and hits the ball, and the ball goes over the fence. So it's A causes B. The difference in temporal and ordered causes is whereas in an ordered cause, if the cause ceases to exist, the effect ceases to exist, if I, the moment I stop pushing the stick or the moment the car, the train engine stops pulling, the stone or the, um, 
the stone or the uh, train car stops moving Im immediately. In the case of a temporal cost, that's obviously not the case. The pitcher let goes of the ball. Uh, if he just disappears all of a sudden, spontaneous combustion, the ball is not going to stop moving. Um, if my parents die, I don't cease to exist. So these are temporal causes in, in the case of the second one, which is what the Kalam is. Uh, third, we're not going to spend a lot of time on uh, the principle of sufficient reason from Gottfried Leibniz. Basically, he argued that every single one of your causes in a causal chain has to have a, uh, a sufficiently explanatory reason for why it, it is or what it isn't. Uh, so that was his particular version. Now, what we're going to focus on, again, is the second one by William Lane Craig, that he's popularized the temporal causes. We have here uh, notes here that says, due to the popularity of Dr. Craig, the Kalam cosmological argument has almost become synonymous with just the term cosmological argument. I've actually talked to uh, quite a few apologists who were not aware of the different kinds. When I just mentioned cosmological argument, they just assume, I mean, the Kalam. This is just uh, how widespread it is. So it's important that you understand uh, not only the Kalam's strengths, but it's also its weaknesses, because this is what everybody has in mind, for the most part, when they say the cosmological argument. Uh, with that in mind, again, what most people, again, thanks in large part to the work of Dr. Craig and others, the little comic like this kind of is what they have in mind with the, with the cosmological argument. You know, you, I thought this was kind of cute. You have a god getting ready to, to you know, push off the, the, the TNT, the, the, the dynamite is about to explode just before the Big Bang roll on Sunday, Sunday the first day of the week. So it's kind of cute. This is what most people have, idea, ha have in mind with the idea of the cosmological argument. You know, God's, god is behind the Big Bang, the one, one who's kind of uh, put all that into motion. You know, what caused the Big Bang? The Christian answer wants to be God. All right, so getting into the argument itself. Now, this is the part that most people are familiar with. If you don't know this, learn this, the, these first three steps. Just learn to say these verbatim. Uh, this is that it, it seeks to prove the necessity of a first cause. It's a very simple argument, and we have it here in front of you. That which comes to existence must have a cause. The universe came into existence, and therefore the universe must have a cause. Now, again, most people know that those first three, uh, but what they don't know is the Kalam, properly stated, actually has a second aspect as well. Once we've assumed, once we've proven, I'm sorry, the necessity of a first cause, therefore the universe has to cause, it has to be one, then typically, if we do it right, we're going to go on and prove the nature of the first cause. Uh, most people don't put that in a formal uh, argument, but it can be formalized like this. The universe is the complete set of things in the space-time continuum. Now, the cause of a thing cannot be a part of the thing itself. Therefore, the cause of the universe that we discovered in the first half cannot be a part of the space-time continuum. And from there, we can extrapolate the nature of that cause if it can't be inside the universe. So, for instance, since time is part of the universe, the cause of the universe can't be in time. It would have to be that is eternal. Since the cause of the universe, I'm sorry, since part of the universe is, is space, then whatever is part of the universe cannot be a part of, in, in space, that we, we have to say it's transcendent. Um, since uh, since matter is part of the universe, then whatever the cause of the universe is can't be material. It would have to be uh, immaterial, or we would call that spiritual. What would you call a, a, an eternal, transcendent spiritual being? I think probably a good name for that is God. So again, I learn these first two aspects. That's really the argument in a nutshell. Uh, and, and really, it's as simple as that. That's really all you, uh, if you want to use it effectively, really understand how to work those out. It's, it's, it's pretty simple uh, to explain from that perspective. But let's go on then uh, and look again at Dr. Craig. He has offered us a, a kind of a visual way to picture what's going on here. You see this chart up there at the top. It says we start with the universe. Again, remember the, uh, all these arguments, the cosmological arguments, start with the cosmos. Now, there's two aspects here. There's two possibilities. One, it could have a not have a beginning, or two, it could have a beginning. Well, obviously, our, we're arguing. I think we're going to see it's pretty evident the universe had a beginning, so the first option is out. Well, if it had a beginning, then that beginning was either uncaused or caused. Now, if we're going to argue again later on that something just being un, an uncaused cause is, is pretty silly. So if something is coming comes into if it has a beginning, if it comes into existence, it has to have a cause, so that knocks out the second possibility. So we're down to the third. Whatever the cause is either within the universe or outside the universe. And again as we said the second half, something cannot be uh, the, the cause of a thing can't be a part of the thing itself. So whatever the cause of the universe has to be outside the universe. Well, then, whatever that outside the universe caused could either be caused by something else or not. If it's not caused by something else, then we have reached a first cause that just exists because it does. 
with the nature we discussed, we'd call that God. But let's just say someone says, well, no, whatever caused the universe also had to have a cause. Well, then you move down to the to the, where you have the like, next two options. Well, then that cause could either be caused by something else or not caused by something else. Now, if someone says, well, that cause is not caused by someone else, then again, you've reached God one way or the other. If, on the other hand, someone says, well, no, that was cause too, well, eventually, you see, you get into a regress, an infinite regress, where you have to eventually come to something that wasn't caused by something else. Again, what the cosmological argument does primarily is going to show us the necessity of a first cause. And then we can go through using the second half of the argument and discuss its nature. But eventually, we see we have to come to some sort of uncaused first cause. And hopefully, that little diagram will help you... Uh, help you kind of visualize what's going on. So let's kind of explain the cosmological argument. Let's kind of walk through these, the first half. We're not going to do the second half for time's sake, uh, because most people spend their time debating the first half. So let's look at the first uh, two premises especially, make sure we have a real good understanding of what the column cosmological argument is. So our per first premise, again, is that that which comes into existence must have a cause. Now there's only three logical possibilities on, on something that comes into existence, what its cause could possibly be. The first is that it doesn't have a cause. The second is that it's self-caused. And the third is that a thing has an external cause, a cause other than itself. Now, which of these I is, is the right answer? Well, I would suggest to you that the idea that something does not have a cause, it just pops into existence, is experientially absurd. It's obvious that from nothing, nothing comes. Now, pause real quick. The, you know, we're going to get into objections later on, but there are some people who will argue that quantum mechanics tells us things just pop into existence from nothing, and I would tell you that's actually not the case. Quantum mechanics does not show things just coming into, it, into existence out of nothing. All we observe is we observe nothing and all of a sudden things being there, but that's a big difference from saying we've observed it coming to existence from nothing. Uh, there's no reason not to believe that in the near future that uh, we won't observe what it is that actually brings those into existence. There's a lot we're still in the process of learning. The, the fact of the matter is, philosophically, it's just silly to say that things just pop into existence out of nothing. And I'll just keep this in mind. By definition, if whatever nothing is, if nothing has the property of being able to produce things, then in fact nothing is not nothing at all. It's something, because it has a property. So the idea that no cause something just is not caused, it's, it's absurd, it's self-contradictory, we, we don't even need to go there. What about the possibility that it's self-caused? Again, I would just suggest this is also self-contradictory for the simple reason that for something to cause itself to exist, it would have to exist in order to produce itself. I did not cause myself to exist. Um, my parents brought me into existence. I didn't, I didn't, in order for me to bring myself into existence, I would have had to have exist in order to bring myself into existence. But again, that's self-contradictory. That's we're trying to explain things coming into existence. So then that leaves the third only logical possibility, which is that things have external causes. And not only is this only the only possible answer, it also lines up with our experience. So this is something that we just recognize to be the case. Things are brought into existence by other things. Uh, and I want to suggest to you, and we're going to talk about this more later on in some detail, this is a necessarily true principle. It's, as soon as you understand what the words mean, it's something you see just it has to be true. There's no way for it not to be true. It's just true by definition. That which comes to existence must have a cause. So that's our first principle. That which comes to existence must have a cause. It's necessarily true. There's no way to get around it. Second, the universe came into existence. Now, how do we know that's the case? Well, there's some evidence. Uh, obviously, the Big Bang, uh, and, and when we that specifically what we're actually referring to is the expansion of the universe. As we, we look out in the space, we see the universe expanding. We can extrapolate backwards when we do the math and look at how the expansion process worked. What scientists have found is that a little over 14 billion years ago, then everything was eventually really in, in an infinitely small point, which is what they consider the beginning of the universe. So the fact the universe is expanding means there was a beginning, which scientists call the Big Bang. Uh, there's what's called the lack of heat death. Uh, make this real simple. Basically, let's just say in a trillion years from now, if, 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 what would happen to our sun in a trillion years? Well, eventually it would burn out. And not only our sun, all the stars in the universe would eventually burn out. And not only all the stars, every single thing in the universe, if, if the universe st st stuck around that long, would eventually just burn out. It would, the universe would just be uniformly cold. That would be called heat death. And when that happens, nothing happen, ha happen anymore. There, uh, according to the second law of thermodynamics, what you find out is entropy has reached its maximum state. There's just nothing can do anything. It's just 
all action of any kind is done. It's univor uniformly cold all throughout the universe. That's called heat death. Well, clearly the universe has not experienced heat death. If it had, we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation. Well, but wait a minute. If the universe had existed forever for all of eternity, it would have had more than enough time to experience heat death. So the fact that it hasn't implies that the universe came into existence a finite time ago. So this then turns out to be a scientific fact that the universe came into existence. And if that's the case, then again, our conclusion necessarily follows. Therefore, the universe must have a cause. So I think our first, our, 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 our argument is very defensible. Uh, it's not too hard to understand. That which comes into existence must have a cause, clearly so by definition. The universe came into existence. There's not a lot of debate about that among scientists. So therefore, it just comes to follow the universe must have a cause. Then what's that cause? That's when you go into the second half of the argument. Uh, with that said, it's uh, as easy as that is to understand and grasp. There are people who, uh, a lot of people actually, who reject that argument. And they offer some traditional objections. First, they tell us it doesn't tell us anything about the nature of the cause. What is the cause? Uh, is it a personal or an impersonal cause? Couldn't it, or couldn't it be a multiverse? Uh, obviously, if we're going to sit here and say it's God, we need to be prepared to try to answer this question. The Kalam doesn't seem to give us an answer to that. Uh, let's just assume that it is a personal God for the sake of argument. Is it a moral God? Is it an immoral God? For that matter, does it care? Is it an amoral God? In fact, some people could make an argument that it, for the second one particularly, what if it's an immoral God? Uh, one of the best ways to think there'd be the proof for an immoral God would be there's suffering in this world. If, if there's a demon God who decided to create a world and wants to uh, make all kind of evil, well, that's exactly what we find, so maybe God is immoral. Or maybe we can be like Thomas Jefferson and just say, be, be deist and say God doesn't care one less. He built everything and left. Uh, that point is, either one of those is a far cry from the God of Christianity or any other theistic God, and the Kalam doesn't seem to have an answer for that. Well, they're ask us, uh, even if we get, assume it's a moral God, then, well, which God in particular? I mean, there's all kind of gods, so this doesn't seem to help us at all. It's kind of like the traditional argument against the... Um, against, um, the Pascal's wager. So, well, which God are you going to kind of put your put your money on? So then, how are we going to answer these? Uh, I would suggest to you the first one you know can possibly be start to answer it if you go into the second half of the argument. But really, all three of these are red herrings. All the Kalam is out to prove is that the universe has a cause outside of itself, and then we can go on to discuss the nature of that cause. Uh, so again, we can look at the second half of the argument to discover some of its nature, if it's personal or not, etc. The second had the second argument, the moral and moral. We would need another argument, for example, the moral argument to get us there. Uh, which God in particular? Well, again, it depends on what we find out about the nature of the cause, which requires further argumentation. We don't need to get, let ourselves get caught up in the idea that the Kalam cosmological argument is out to try to prove that there is a particular God, say the Christian God, is the creator. Uh, the argument has a limited scope, so make sure you understand its usefulness up front. Don't try to use it as a not-gun argument for, say, Christianity. And don't present it that way. If you present it as we're just trying to show that some sort of cause is for the universe, which gets us to start talking about God, get us in the right direction, well, then that's, this, is, this is an argument you may want to use to get that conversation going. But that's really all it is. How, the point is, though, that none of these objections are, in fact, objections. They don't get us away from the fact the universe has a cause. They just complain that we don't know anything about the nature of the cause. Well, then fine. We'll use further argumentation for that. Right now, we just want to know, does, in fact, the universe have a cause? Well, then some, there are some people, though, who, who really want to go further. They want to say the argument itself doesn't work. So they challenge the first premise. Now, we have stated that, that which comes into existence must have a cause. O oftentimes, you will hear this simply stated much more simply as everything must have a cause. Now, why do you think people state it that way? Well, that way they can ask this question. Well, then what caused God? If everything has to have a cause, well, then God is to something, so he has to have a cause also by our own argument, so therefore nothing's actually proven. But wait, if we think about it, clearly there's a difference and everything must have a cause and that which comes into existence must have a cause. Again, notice, that which comes into existence is the kind of thing that has to have a cause. So we should be point out that we should just point out that God, whatever He is, is not the kind of thing that comes into existence. He, whatever God is, He exists simply because He exists. That, that if nothing else, is a minimal definition of God. So I don't think this objection uh, disproves 
the cosmological argument. It certainly doesn't disprove the first premise. Now, we have a second objection, which is uh, going to try to take our previous objection and try to make it a little more philosophically coherent. And it's, this, is, this is stronger. Now, look at our first, our, our first premise here. It implies there are two types of objects. There are those objects that begin to exist, and then those, ob those objects that do not begin to exist. That's the implication. That which comes into existence must have a cause. That implies that we're not saying anything about the kind of things that don't come into existence. So two kinds of objects here, those that come into existence and those that don't. But here's the problem. Ask this question, what doesn't come into existence other than God? Can you think of anything? Everything in our experience comes into existence at some point. Now, if you're a Platonist, you may argue that things like uh, the color red or the number three doesn't come into existence, but outside of those kind of things, it's pretty apparent um, that the total set of all things that don't come into existence would just be God. Now, if we accept that reduction, then we have this problem. The two types can be reduced, the two types of things can be reduced to God and everything else. So then one could, in fact, the first premise, that which must, I'm sorry, that which comes into existence must have a cause, can be restated as everything other than God has a cause. Now to this, the objector may say, but that's just circular reasoning, because it just defines God into existence. If we're saying everything other than a God has a cause, we're just assuming that there's a God. Now, how would we respond to this objection? I, th I don't think it's that hard. Uh, we can just concede the point and say it still proves the universe has a cause. Remember, our idea is very limited here. So let's follow their, th this assume, let's accept their reduction for the sake of argument. Everything other than God has a cause. Well, the universe is certainly other than God. The universe is not God. Whatever the universe is, is not God. Now, you can maybe pantheist would say that, that the universe is God, but the point is, the our universe, the, the argument still follows that the universe has a cause. Whatever that cause is, ultimately we're going to try to show down the road by studying its nature is going to be a cause. So even if we accept this more philosophical reduction, the argument still holds that the universe has a cause and therefore does not turn out to be circular as some objectors may claim. And as you have heard said, that was easy. Another argument was put forward by Hume and Kant. Uh, the, they complained that about the whole principle of causality in the first place. They put out an argument that said that, and without going into too much detail, that causality really is only in our mind. Uh, imagine, for example, clapping your hands. You strike your hands together, and the next thing you hear is a sound. And you always, every single time you clap your hands together, you always hear sounds. So you come to asso associate and assume that when you strike your hands together, when you clap, you produce the clapping sound. The, so you say the clap causes the sound. That's the, that's the nature. And of course, we do this all the time. When you drop something, it falls. So, you know, dropping it causes the falling. What they pointed out, though, is that what you, in fact, what you see is you don't, you don't observe the cause, the causality. What you observe is your hands striking together. Next, you observe the sound, and so you're, you psychologically make a connection. So for them, causality is psychological because you never actually observe the causing itself your mind just assumes there's a cause. Now their point was, you have no right in which to say that what's a psychological connection applies to the extra mental world. You just don't know the extra mental world works that way. You have no way of knowing, says David Hume and Immanuel Kant. Now there's some really deep philosophy that goes into that that we can get into another time. We're not going to hear, but I, if any of you are familiar with Star Trek, you'll be certainly familiar with Captain Kirk. I think he gave the greatest answer to this, and I found a really great video clip of Kirk refuting Hume and Kant. I want to show it to you real quick. Well, there you go. Uh, maybe you feel like that's not such a response, but I, there are some things, dealing very practically, where we kind of have to do this. Uh, I, this is the kind of argument that, in my opinion, gives philosophy a bad name, and you're talking to somebody who spends a lot of time studying philosophy. You know what? If someone's going to sit there and tell you that 
causality is just inside your mind and it doesn't really work in the real world well you know what it's kind of hard these people are being kind of silly anyway and just you know put your head just do a face palm and just just move on uh, there are some people who will just do anything to avoid uh, the natural obvious consequence of their argument if they have to go that far to 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 see the obvious then you know they they have other i think issues anyway there are ways around uh, if you really want to get technical and you really insist on arguing with these people, you can look into what I would suggest the Aristotelian principles of causality, uh, especially with relates to hylomorphism. You can Google all that stuff. Um, email me and we can walk through that kind of stuff. But this is just something I would suggest from a fairly practical perspective. Just don't go into that. It, that's it's kind of a waste of time. I'm, in my opinion, it just is. So I think the first premise holds pretty clear, pr pretty well. What if the second premise, the universe came into existence? Some people will attack that one instead. They'll ask this question, what if the universe didn't come into existence? What if it's eternal? Now this, you should know, is the historical atheist position. Historically, atheists have wanted to argue that the universe was eternal. So they come up with scientific models, the steady state theory, the oscillating model. There's all kind of these models that tries to suggest the universe, uh, matter, energy, has always been here from all of eternity, even though modern science, uh, via the Big Bang and second law of ther thermodynamics, uh, complete, completely, di completely uh, disregards those kind of ideas. Now the point is there's just no warrant from science for those kind of things. Those have been debunked. Um, yeah, s someday in the future somebody may come up with a different one, but for the time being there's just no credible scientific evidence that the universe did in fact not come into existence. There's no way to argue, scientifically speaking, that the universe is eternal. So if we're going to pay any attention to science whatsoever, we have to concede the fact that the universe came into existence. So I don't think this objection carries very much weight. Now again, going back to more philosophy, returning to our friend Hume, and another guy who was influenced very much by Hume, Bertrand Russell. They would argue that this second one, this second, uh, this second premise pr present, uh, commits what's called the fallacy of composition, which says a thing, uh, basically, a fallacy of composition is when you confuse um, a, 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 comp a composite whole with individual parts. They would say that things come into existence, but the universe is not a thing. And so Russell asks this question, if every man has a mother, does that mean the human race has a mother? No, that's a fallacy of composition. If you look at the paper, email me and I'll send it to you. The example I use there uh, is this little cute little story. Suppose um, a new college student, a, pers pers a prospective college student, goes on to, say, Harvard campus, and he gets a tour of the campus, and you know, he sees the administrative buildings, and he sees the courtyard, and he sees the library and the classrooms, and at the end of the tour, he says to the tour guy, well, that was fantastic. Now, can you show me the college? Well, obviously, that pr student probably would not be a prospective student very long. He's committed a composition fallacy. Uh, he has been seeing the college. You can't separate the college from a, uh, it's not this extra thing. It, it, it's, it's a composition of the whole. So what they would say is, when you talk about the universe coming into existence, you're, you're talking about a whole, when in fact the universe is, is a composition. That's like, it, it just doesn't work that way. Now, we can respond to that. I, I don't think um, it's, it's all that hard to respond to that. Even if you take the universe as a composite, and, and they're right, we ought to. The universe is a composite. All the individual things must have come into existence at some point. And so where did that first thing, that first particle, that first moment of, uh, come in, what, what cause did? The universe as a whole couldn't be the cause of its individual parts. For, we talked about that before. A part of a thing can't be the, the cause of the whole. It, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work that way at all. So even the fallacy of composition, I, I don't think, holds any water. You still have to explain where the first set... Uh, it, let's say there's a million things in the universe. There's obviously a lot more, but just whatever. Ten things in the universe, whatever. At some point, the first of that ten set had that first thing had to come into existence. So when we talk about the universe coming to existence, we're just talking about that first moment where the first member of the first set comes into existence. So I, I don't think the fallacy of composition works here. Others will try to turn the tables on you, and they'll try to do a reverse cosmological argument. They'll say the universe is defined as everything that exists. Therefore, if God exists, then God is part of the universe, and he would then need a cause. Ah, isn't that kind of cute? The problem is this can't be true because this would go back to setting up for infinite regress. Because, okay, fine, let's concede that. God is part of the universe. Our argument still proves that God needs a cause and that the universe needs a cause. Well, then, what's that? What's the cause of that? 
well, whatever that causes is, is whatever that causes something that exists. So then that needs a cause. It's, it, it goes on forever, and th th it doesn't help us. The bigger problem is that it misdefines the universe. The universe is not defined as everything that exists, no matter what people try to tell you. Even scientists will talk about this universe versus that universe when talking about the multiverse theory. The multiverse, th multiverse theory is the idea that our universe is one universe among many, p billions, if, if not an infinite number of universes. Uh, they suppose they support they really put that forward because of the design argument that we're not going to talk to or uh, to try to explain how uh, the fine tuning uh, explains how life could get here when the chances were so very small uh, so the point is the universe remember remember back on our our early our early definition the universe is the compo composite of all things in our space time continuum not of all things that exist absolutely so that's that's just a wrong definition Another one is that people try to accuse us of a fallacy of equivocation. Basically, they see everything in our first premise. Uh, it's not is the not being used the same way as the word everything in the second premise. So basically, they would reset our argument as follows: everything that comes into existence has a cause. Well, that's fair. We can accept that. However, everything that exists that equals the universe has a cause. Therefore, everything that comes into existence has a cause. Now, this would be a fallacy if we state it this way, uh, because again, the word everything in the first premise does not mean the same thing as everything in the second premise. Now, let me help you, again, give you an example to uh, explain that. Suppose I said to you, um, Jesus is the door. Our second premise is that all doors are made of wood. Well, the conclusion is Jesus, therefore, is made of wood. Well, of course, you would just look at me and laugh. Uh, even if you agree that Jesus is the door, you would say, well, Chris, but the door there is being used metaphorically. The word door is used being used in two different senses. Well, that's exactly right. The point of a logical argument is the words, the terms, have to be used the same way. So here we have the argument that the word everything is not being used in the, in the same way. But again, I don't think this argument I I is going to stand because, again, we have our same point. Even if we take the universe as a composite there, in the second premise, everything that exists, we're talking about a composite there. Uh, it, you still have to explain where the first thing came from, where that first item in the universe came from. So our first everything really just means anything, any given thing that comes to existence as a cause. Well, if the universe is everything that exists, then at one time, if there was only one thing that existed, that first particle, the first part of the universe, well, then that would still need a cause at that point. So, despite the sophistry and the claims this is a fallacy of equivocation, I think they're just overstating the case. There's no fallacy here at all. It, it just doesn't hold. So I think it's fair to say that the, the, the traditional objections that we've walked through don't, don't hold. Um, the Kalam cosmological argument does stand against the particular typical, typical arguments, and it does prove that the universe needs a cause. However, I would suggest to you that, in fact, there is a Christian objection. When, and I say it's a Christian because it was first put forward that I'm aware of by a Christian named Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theological um, in section 1, question 46, article 2. And you can read that online for free, but here I have a quote. He says, it's by faith alone that we hold, and not by demonstration can it be proved that the world did not always exist. In other words, he's saying that our second premise, we have a problem with our second premise because that's something we know by faith. Well, if you know it by faith, then that means you know that God did it. Well, that makes the whole argument circular, makes it question-begging because you're just assuming God at the outset. And I think he's actually right about this. Uh, how can you prove, how do you know for sure that the universe came into existence? Well, we talked about that a minute ago. Well, let me clarify Aquinas' objection here by looking at, s at some important terms. We need to un understand the difference in a necessary versus a contingent truth. A necessary truth is something that must be true by definition. And it is known as soon as the terms are grasped or understood. So let me give you an example. All unmarried men are bachelors. As soon as you understand what unmarried men are, and as soon as you understand what bachelors are, you immediately see that statement is necessarily true. It doesn't matter if you've never met a man, if you, or it doesn't matter if there's no such thing as unmarried men. It is still necessarily true that all unmarried men are bachelors. All triangles have three sides. These are necessary truths. Two plus two equals four. These are necessary truths. They're truths by definition. As soon as you understand the terms, you immediately understand that it must be true. Compared to that is a contingent truth. This is something that 
is true, but may be false. You are watching this presentation, but you may not have been. It is true that you're watching it, but there's no reason that you had to be watching it. Not, it's not necessarily true in the same way that all unmarried men are bachelors is necessarily true. So the way you know a contingent truth is first the terms have to be grasped. You have to know what a presentation is and what you are to know that you're watching the presentation is true or not. But then you ha that has to be verified by observation because it may or may not be the case. So that's the difference in a necessary and a contingent truth. Now, keeping that in mind, I want to ask a couple of questions about our argument. Let's look at our first premise. That which comes to existence must have a cause. Is this premise a necessary or a contingent truth? Does it have to be true, or does it just happen to be true? Well, as soon as we look at our terms, we realize this is a necessary truth by definition. If something comes into existence, we are saying, another way of saying, another way of saying something came into existence is to say that it had a cause. That's what we're talking about. So it's necessarily true that that which comes into existence has a cause. Therefore, how do we know this first premise? Do we need any scientific evidence or observations? No, this is, we know this by reason alone. We, just by knowing the meaning of the words, that which comes into existence, the meaning of the term cause, we know that the first premise is true by sheer fact of what the words mean. But let's look at the second premise. The universe came into existence. Now, is this a necessary or contingent truth? When you know what the universe is, do you automatically know, by understanding the universe, that it came into existence? I would submit that you do not. This is, in fact, a contingent truth. Now, it is certainly the case the universe came into existence. But it's also certainly the case that you're listening right now, you're watching this presentation. It did Just like you didn't have to be, by definition, watching this presentation, you could have been doing something else. Well, it's feasible that the universe didn't have to come into existence. It may never, never exist at all, or perhaps it's possible that there is a universe somewhere that's eternal. There's, no, there's nothing in the nature of a universe that says it has, to be, it has to come into existence, like there is, say, in the nature of an unmarried man, that he must be a bachelor. So then how do we know that the universe came into existence? Well, we have to have reason, and we have to have scientific observation. You, one is not enough. So our first premise to understand Aquinas' objection, we have to understand that our first premise is necessary, our second premise is contingent. Now if that's the case, then we come up, let's keep, get a third concept in mind. You may have heard somebody mention a God of the Gaps argument before. A God of the Gaps is an argument in which one says that God has to exist because it's the only way to explain some phenomena that can't be explained any other way. Now you, throughout history we've seen this quite often. Uh, the, the, the Greeks thought that Thunder, lightning was Th Zeus's thunderbolts. Zeus got mad, he threw some lightning bolts. That explains lightning, right? Or they thought that the sun moving across the sky, since they thought that the sun revolved around the earth, well, had they explained that, they thought that it was the god Apollo driving his chariot across the sky. See, the gods were explaining because they didn't have uh, this phenomenon because they didn't have the proper science to explain it. They filled the gap in their science in with the supernatural, with God. Or you would have the American Indians. They wanted rain. How did they think they got rain? Well, they would do rain dances. So again, you see what they're doing. They're, they're filling in God to account for their, how they don't understand the supernatural. I mean, the natural. So we, my, what we do, this is when our science is insufficient. We, we just want to plug God in there. That's a God of the gaps argument. What we find then, when we turn back to our Kalam, is we, we have a problem here. Let's look at our second contingent premise. The universe came into existence. How do we know that? Again, we've mentioned this. The Big Bang, the expansion of the universe, the science, lack of heat, death, and other reasons. This is a scientific fact. That makes it contingent. Well, let me ask you a question. What if, for the sake of argument, science overturns these discoveries and argues eventually that the universe is eternal? There's been all kinds of things in history that we were convinced were true then we found out later on scientifically were not the case. And Christians may object, no, 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 but the Bible says that the universe came into existence. Well, look what you're doing with Thomas Aquinas. You're taking it on faith. Christians were also convinced for a long, long time that the sun revolved around the earth because they thought the Bible taught that. Well, what if the case comes up? Because remember, this is a contingent truth. It can be overshown thrown to be wrong. What happens then if, for some odd reason, science tries to argue the universe eventually is... Is, is eternal? What if science can explain the lack of heat death? What if science can, uh, maybe science discovers the Big Bang is wrong or finds some model that allows for an early eternal universe? If that's the case, then the Kalam argument, as stated, 
actually becomes an argument from ignorance. It becomes a God of the gaps argument. It becomes a circular argument. We're assuming God's existence in the second premise when you say the universe came into existence. When in fact, what you really are saying here is it seems to us the universe came into existence because we have no other way uh, of seeing otherwise, so God must have done it. That's really what you're saying with the second premise. And I think that does make the argument fail, and that's Aquinas' point. We take it on faith that the universe came into existence. So the Kalam, as stated, is not a good argument because you can't take it on faith that the universe came into existence because God says so and then use your faith to prove God. That's circular. That's begging the question. That's God of the gaps. You, you just can't do that. It doesn't work. Thomas Aquinas, in, in another work, the Summa Contra Gentiles, uh, section, uh, book 2, uh, section, 30, par section 38, and then paragraph 8, says this. Now these arguments, he's talking about all these different arguments that try to prove that the universe came into existence, because there was a whole bunch of people who were trying to argue that the universe came into existence, all kind of ways. He said, now these arguments, though they do not, are not devoid of probability, they lack absolute and necessary conclusiveness. They're not necessary truths. Hence, it is sufficient to deal with them quite briefly, um, lest the Catholic faith, which he was a Catholic, appear to be founded on ineffectual reasoning and not as it is on the most solid teachings of God. Aquinas was concerned, as are we, with knowing that his faith was true. He didn't want his faith to be based on contingent, probable, possible truths. Now, I would suggest that there's a way to, there's a way to fix the Kalam, there's a way to ground it, and make it actually more powerful than the traditional rendering. To do that, when you see there's two ways of understanding this minor premise, the, the second premise the universe came into existence. First, we can understand it as a contingent truth as it ought to be. The universe probably came into existence. And then we have our evidence to try to back up the fact, our, our claim that it probably came into existence. There's the, lack, there's the Big Bang, the lack of heat death. You can put all kind of other arguments for it. Or you can try to make the harder case, the universe necessarily came into existence. Now, there are actually people, we're going to go backwards, who try to argue the universe necessarily came into existence because they don't want to make a probable argument. They want to avoid Aquinas', Aquinas objection. And, and William Lane Craig would be an example of this. Uh, he would argue, for instance, um, I'll give you just real quick two arguments that people who try to use, well, I'll just show you right here on the next slide. This, this is the way they try to defend the second premise. Uh, they would say this argument right here, an eternal universe would actually be, would be actually infinite, but any actual infinity entails absurdities, and therefore any eternal universe would be absurd. So it can't be true. And if that's the case, then they would be right that the they would be right therefore that the second premise would be necessary and the Kalam would would work as stand. Does this argument right here work though? The first premise is self evidently true. It is certainly true that an eternal universe would actually be infinite. And I think we're okay with that. But what about this second argument? Is it actually true that any actual in infinity necessarily entails absurdities? Why should we believe this is true? I don't think we should. Now, there are two arguments that I'll give you that people, there are more, but these are the two big ones, again, the ones that Craig uses and others, uh, that try to try to prove this. The first, they would say, well, if the universe was eternal, then you would have an infinite amount of time in the past, and it's, you cannot transgress, you cannot traverse an, an, an infinite amount of time to get to the present, so therefore it's absurd to say the universe existed infinitely in the past. And they try to prove that very simply. I want you to count to zero, starting from negative infinity. Well, you can't even get started. And so they would say then, therefore, that proves the absurdity. But that's easy to overcome in two ways. In the first case, remember that the universe is not a singular being. It is true that a singular being cannot, trans cannot traverse an, an, an infinity. Even God cannot traverse an infinity of time. If he's singular, that just doesn't make any sense. You can't do that. But the universe, remember, is a composite thing. And if the universe is eternal, it's a composite of an infinite number of things. And so an infinite number of things could traverse an infinite amount of time. There's no reason that that couldn't be the case. So in the first case, I just don't think that works. In the second case, um, it's really kind of silly to say you have to start from, an infinite, from a particular infinite amount of time period in the past anyway. Any point is a finite point. You can't, you can talk about an infinite past, but all you're saying is there's an infinite number of things back in the past. You can't actually say, let's start counting from an infinite past. You have to identify a point. All measurements are between two finite points. 
All of them are. And so there's no reason a finite entity can't tra traverse between two finite points. So I don't think this first argument works at all. Um, it j that we just need to ignore that one. Th the second argument used by William Lane Craig is called Hilbert's Paradox. Uh, basically, what it, he asks us to imagine there's a hotel in which you've got an infinite number of uh, of rooms in this hotel, but there's an infinite number of guests, each occupying a room. So there's no vacancies in this hotel, but I come up to this hotel and I'd like to get a room. Now the manager is shrewd. He goes, well, wait a minute, I think I know how to get you a room, even though there's no vacancies. So this is what he says. He says, I'm going to move the person in room one to room two, the person in room two to room three, the person in room three to room four, all the way to infinity, and this would create an empty room. So somehow, he actually created a room, even a vacancy, even though there's an infinite number of rooms that have been taken by an infinite number of guests. And he, so Craig wants to say that this is logically self-contradictory and it's absurd. And he gives more examples of that that you can see in the paper. Uh, but I want to suggest to you that uh, with all of, all of Craig's reasoning aside, it, he fails here for two reasons. The first reason is that um, at best all he shows is that there can't be a simultaneous actual, actual infinity. Uh, in, in the Hilbert's paradox, then you have an infinite number of things happening at the same time. Well, there's no, nothing that says the universe can't be geographically, uh, in terms of physically finite, got a limited, lo limited amount of space, but yet goes infinitely back in the past. That's, that would be an infinite temporal sequence. That's not happening simultaneously. Uh, so his, I, don't, I don't think his analogy works. I don't think his Hilbert's paradox helps prove his case. Uh, the other reason is really more fundamental. Hilbert's uh, little paradox, his little hotel there doesn't prove that an actual infinity is impossible. It just, it doesn't, it just proves that it's counterintuitive. Things just, it's, it's weird to think about. But there's a lot of weird things to think about. And again, going back to quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics uh, says that you have to turn a particle 720 degrees to get it back to a full turn. Well, that doesn't make any sense to us, but that's just the nature of it. You know, reality can be a weird thing sometimes. Counterintuitive is not the same thing as self-contradictory. It's not the same thing as absurd. It's just counterintuitive. So I don't think, shy of anybody putting forward any arguments that I've never seen a good one yet, I don't think that we can defend the idea that the universe necessarily has to come into existence. We can conceive of an eternal universe because it's possible. Is it true? I don't think so. I take that on faith. But it's but it, either way, um, I, the point is it's conceivable and, and, and uh, so I think that this is this 2b fails. So it seems to me then, since it's false, we should accept 2a. And then we, we should restate our argument this way. Everything that comes to existence has a cause. The universe probably came into existence. Therefore, the universe probably has a cause. Now, this is a valid argument. It is not a god of the gaps argument. Why is it not a god of the gaps? There's a reason it's pretty simple. It recognizes that science could overturn 2a. The universe probably came into existence. Well, someday the, the you know, the science may, may prove that's not the case. But here's the point. It draws valid inferences from the evidence as we currently have it. Look, it is also probably true that if, that if I drop my pencil, it's going to fall to the ground because we have a theory called gravity. Now, we are not 100% certain that gravity is true. You may be shocked by that, but we're not. Science can never, by its nature, be 100% certain about anything. It can be scientifically certain, which is to say that there's, it has, there's no scientific reason to doubt it. But that's not absolute certainty. That's just probability. It is absolutely possible that we may find out that our view of gravity was wrong. You know, this is what's going on again in quantum. In fact, it, it, I would suggest it's actually not all that impossible, not all the improbable. Uh, if you look at the way uh, Einstein thought about gravity, the way quantum mechanics again looks at gravity, quantum physics, they don't, they don't match. We've got to find some way to, some way to make... Re, way to re-understand gravity. So maybe our view of gravity is wrong in the first place. So that's not to say things won't fall. That's to say that maybe science will change its view about some things. Will just change its view. It's about other things. Nothing in science is 100% certain. Everything is probable. But probable doesn't mean that 50-50, maybe yes, maybe no. It just means to what degree of probability. Some things are very, 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 very highly probable. 99.999999% certain type probable. And you can draw valid inferences based on that kind of certainty. Well, 
I would insist to you the universe probably came into existence. That's a that's a scientific that's as close to a scientific certainty as we can get. I mean, it has to be the case based on everything we know about modern science. And so when I tell to you the universe probably has a cause, I am speaking on what science is telling me is the case right now. That's not a god of the gaps. Science tells me the universe probably has a cause. If everything that comes to existence has a cause, and the universe science tells me probably came into existence, then it seems the universe very much likely has a cause, and we can go on then to discuss what that cause is. If someone then wants to insist, well, no, the universe probably does not have a cause, contrary to science, my question is, what is their warrant for thinking that science would overturn the second premise in our restated Kalam argument? I would suggest it's most likely a, pre -com a pre-existing commitment to atheism. And if they make that argument, what they're actually doing is getting into their own circular argument. It's important here that then we're, we're now addressing the presuppositions. Why would someone believe that, that science would ever prove that the universe didn't come into existence when all of the evidence points that way? So don't take the probably here as making the argument weaker. I think it makes it stronger because it grounds it in what it properly is. Remember, a cosmological argument is an a posteriori argument. It, it, it's based on contingent truths. It's not a necessary truth. So we're examining it the evidence this is what it looks like is almost certainly the case. Well, if it's almost certainly the case, well, then we have an almost certain belief. Yeah, is it logically possible wrong? Yeah, but what's your reason for believing that it might not be? You better have me really, really good reasons to believe that, say, gravity doesn't work when we have high, high, high probability that it does. You see what I'm saying? Ask for their warrant. I have a good warrant for believing the universe has a cause. What do they have? I don't see anything there. As we conclude, I want to leave you uh, just uh, more about just a God of the Gaps sidelight. Uh, I got this from a professor, um, Doug Craig, and he's, he's a PhD. He used to teach at Acadia University. He wrote this way back in 1996 and have his website. Really little letters at the bottom. You can go see this. But he tells this story, and I'm not going to read the thing to you. You can pause this and read it yourself. Uh, basically, uh, about the the the, the wife, his, he's in an argument with his wife, where his wife asks him to hang a plant, and he goes and hangs the plant, and then she sees it hanging there by a hook, and she's like, "Well, how do I know that?" It, it, you, she accuses him there um, uh, of not hanging the plant because it's on the hook. Well, you said you do it. Well, I did do it, but no, the hook's doing it. The point here. Is and this is really important for understanding the way the God of the Gaps criticism needs to be understood because some of it's if that's fair and some of it's not. Just like if I hang my uh, a, a, a plant for my wife by a hook, well, yeah, the hook is holding the plant up, but I'm the one who put that hook up there. I'm the one who put that. I'm the one who put that that plant up there. It'd be really silly of my wife to accuse me of lying because the hook is doing the work and not me. Likewise, just because science can demonstrate how something works does not mean that God did not set it up that way. That would be like accusing my wife accusing me of not of lying because I said I would hang the hook up when in fact the 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 planet when in fact the hook's doing it. Just because science can explain how something happens doesn't mean God didn't do it. All explain all science is doing is explaining how it's happening. Who's not to say that God is not the one behind that doing that? Now you can get into questions, well then why do you need God for that? But that's another argument entirely. My point is that science doesn't rule out God. It, it, he, it just doesn't. Even if we figure everything out, that still doesn't rule out God. And I think this quote right here is a great way to sum it up, summarize this. It's tempting. As tempting as it often may be, it is a mistake to consider the failure of science to, to explain something as proof of God's work. We do this all the time. Let's take one that I personally think that I don't know that science will ever find an example of, uh, proof of, how did life come about? You know, evolutionary schemes will have us believe that the early life, the first life forms, organized themselves into a self-replicating molecule, and that's how life got started. Well, science has no idea how that happened. They have some, well, they have some ideas, but nothing seems to be panning out. And so a lot of Christians and creationists will say, see, you, science can't figure it out, so God must have done it. Again, what, what Craigan tells us here is that it's a mistake to consider that failure as proof of God's work. Why? Such failures are nothing more or less than a demonstration of how far science has progressed. And more importantly, it's a pointer to where science pro progress needs 
to be made, scientific progress needs to be made, more research needs to be done in that area. And this is the really great and interesting part of this quote is, quote is the last part. Believing in a creator means not doubting the quality of his creation. It is ironic that we often try to prove the existence of God by claims that essentially say he isn't such a great creator. The God of the Gaps arguments are, are, again, they can be valid, but whenever someone levels them at you, just keep in mind, most atheists who level these arguments are actually, they've got the motivation wrong. They're trying to say that if there's science, that science explains it, therefore you don't need God. But that, that's not necessarily the case at all. Uh, all that's doing is explaining you know, how God does it. Uh, it just really shows how great of a creator God is. We don't have to be afraid of science. Whatever your view is of this, all this stuff is, you don't have to be afraid of science. Uh, God is a great creator, and as a great creator, he made a, a, a physical world that actually works. How amazing of a thought is that? So I hope you've enjoyed this presentation, the cosmological argument, grounding the Kalam. I hope you have seen the Kalam can be grounded in its true nature, because if we don't ground it as, an, in fact, a contingent argument that proves that God probably exists, and by probably existence I mean high, high, high likely probability, if we don't ground it that way, then I'm afraid it may be grounded another way that it can't even get off the ground. Uh, it's really important to have the arguments the right way. Again, if you have any questions, again, my name is Chris Morrison. You can get me at Chris Morrison at cccgracealone.org. Um, I have email me. I've got um, I've got an entire course that you may be interested in. Uh, it takes you 12 weeks. That starts with how you know truth. It takes you all the way up then through how you know that Jesus Christ really rose from the dead and how Christianity is true. It makes things really, really simple. Uh, but just, just to wrap up with our, our major thing again, just keep in mind the really, really big idea for the Kalam cosmological argument. It's, it's for all of our discussion, all these details. It's really, really a simple thing. Where did the universe come from? The first part of the universe, th this whole thing, this, this existing world, where did it come from? That, that's really what it comes down to. Something had to cause it. And if something caused it, whatever caused it has to be outside of it. So whatever our cause is, is outside of the universe. Now, again, we can do more presentations later to examine the nature of that cause, but I hope you found this helpful. You have my email address here if you have any questions. Again, please feel free to email me. And again, thank you once more for joining me. I wish you all the best, and God bless.